uh, in the future, uh, virtual reality will be full immersion. It will feel like your body uh, is in a virtual environment. Uh, and it could be the same body you have in real reality or a different body, but you'll be walking around. Uh, and the way that will work, the nanobots in, will go into your brain. Uh, they will expand your intelligence. They'll interact with your biological neurons. They'll be on the internet. Uh, but they, they also could shut down the signals coming from your real senses, your eyes, your ears, your skin, replace them with the signals that your brain would be receiving if you were in the virtual environment. So then to your brain, it feels like you're in that virtual environment. You go to move your arm, it doesn't move your real arm, it moves your virtual arm, which could look like your real arm or it could look different. And so you can be an actor in these virtual environments. And the environments can be different just like choosing a different website, there, some will be like earthly environments, like walking on a beach or the Taj Mahal. Some could be imaginary environments that don't exist on Earth or couldn't exist on Earth because they're fantastic environments. Uh, you can choose different bodies with different environments. A couple could become each other, take on each other's body, or, or, or you could just become, uh, take on the appearance of some movie star or what, whatever you, you want. And then you'll have uh, interactions with other people, just like you do today on Second Life, but it's only visual and auditory. In the future, it, it will be tactile. You touch another virtual person, you'll feel them. And uh, so you can engage in uh, sensual experiences from shaking hands to, to having a sexual experience. So we are going to be immortal, and we can take any shape. We're going to be like gods. Well. There's an interesting discussion about immortality. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that software lives forever. It can transcend the hardware that it's on. Right now, we, our software runs in our brains. So this, this and the software is, is built into the shape of the brain and the connections and so on. But when the hardware crashes, the software dies with it. We have that idea, we call it death. Uh, we don't have that idea with our machines. We can already see that the software has a separate life from the machine. You back up the software, you can smash the machine, and then you recreate the personality of the machine by just loading the software in another machine. Uh, we are, the whole pattern of connections we have in our brain and neurotransmitters and ion channels, that's all information. When we can capture that and recreate it, uh, we will become just like the software on our machines today. And it won't necessarily die when the hardware crashes the way we do now. But that doesn't mean it's immortal. Suppose you forget about some word processing program and you go back to it 25 years later and it's a program written in WordStar. There's no copies of WordStar around and no computers to run them and the operating systems don't exist and the help desks aren't exist anymore. And try recreating that software program. It's pretty much dead because you forgot about it. Uh, the lesson is that software lives only if you care about it. Uh, that's pretty much true of our lives today. People don't care about themselves. They don't tend to live very long. Uh, but that will very literally be the case. We will have to maintain ourselves. You can't just forget about you know, your software files for 20 years and come back and you'll find that it, it's disintegrated. It doesn't run anymore. Nobody's kept track of it. Nobody backed it up. It doesn't run on the latest hardware. Um, so that's actually kind of a moral lesson, that, that software lives if somebody cares about it. And when we become software, we will live if we care about ourselves. Uh, so software doesn't necessarily live forever, but we do have more control over it. And we will transcend the sort of hardware limitations we have now, where we, our software, our mind file, which is a file of information, it is what it is, uh, but right now it sort of runs on this hardware that has all kinds of limitations, it ages, it gets uh, dysfunctional, subject to all kinds of diseases. We'll ultimately be able to transcend all of that. And as to you know, where does it come from and how does it evolve, I mean, I, we can't answer all of those questions. That's why we call it the singularity. Uh, we're making a metaphor. Uh -huh. yeah. It's a metaphor borrowed from physics where you have this event horizon around a black hole that's very hard to see beyond. And there's a lot of interesting discussions. Can you, in theory, see inside a black hole? And uh, I mean, it's a long, complicated discussion. But the point is, it's very hard to see beyond 
that event horizon. So it's hard to see beyond the singularity because it's some way so different from life today that um, it's hard to see beyond. But I think some of the things we care about today are gonna remain the same. Most of what we care about today is information. Uh, if you go back 100 years, most people did physical work. Most people today do mental work. They're journalists creating journalism stories or they're writing something or they're creating information about financial products or most people create uh, information and uh, that will continue to be the case. And knowledge, human knowledge is growing exponentially. The doubling time I think has been measured at about 14 months. So human knowledge doubles every 14 months. And so you go out 50 years, it's, we're gonna be caring about the same thing, but it'll be that much more complex. We'll have many more types of music and art and science and technology, and we'll be arguing about similar kinds of things, but we'll have. So instead of God creating the universe, it's going to be the universe through us creating God. Uh, I mean, that's about as close to God as you can imagine. I mean, it, uh, anything we've said about God would apply uh, to the universe waking up in this way, but it's still not infinite. I mean, it's, it's, it's vast. It's trillions of trillions of trillions of times greater than we are today, but it's still not infinite. So that's why I say evolution is a spiritual process because it moves towards greater complexity. It moves towards all the attributes that we attribute to God, intelligence, creativity, beauty, love, all of these things grow at an exponential rate. God has been described as having those attributes at an infinite level. Uh, we, even at this one, we can expand to the rest of the universe, we won't be infinite, but it'll, you know, from our perspective today, it certainly will seem that way. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. That's wonderful. Visiting time is over, Mr. Robbins. Okay.